Hi, and welcome to Time Out Coaching with Tony Garbalotto. Today, I have one of the very best British coaches, someone that has coached at the highest levels internationally, including stops with G League teams, two national team head coaching jobs and stops in Japan and Germany. A true trailblazer for British coaches internationally. I'm pleased to welcome Coach Tim Lewis. Coach, Tony G. Good to see how are you? you? Great to see you I'm as very well. well. Um, I mean, first of all, I mean, I, I do want to say, you know, we've we've known each other, you know, almost our, you know, a whole kind of career and, um, you know, in some ways have mirrored each other. Obviously, you've coached at such a such a great level. Um, so but I mean, let's talk more about to start with to give, to give the audience. Let's talk about your early basketball experiences, you know where you, you know, you started playing basketball and that whole um, situation. Cause I think it's a great story in, in that respect there. Sure. Um, you know, like, I, I guess like any, any kids in England, you get introduced to it at, um, at secondary school. And I had two teachers at secondary school who were uh, advocates for basketball um, and, you know, played there. But the, the, I guess my, formative years with basketball we were really through the Folkestone Saints um there was a group of players there that uh sort of took me under their wing and I ended up playing men's basketball from a really early age to, you know 13 14 um and that was you know that there was also that that stuff was also promoted by uh, Mark Clark Martin Clark and and uh and his parents their parents um, and they were they were a catalyst in in that for me they they initiated then moving on from Folkestone to go and play in the Crystal Palace when Mark was there um, Mark Dunning was was running the the junior program um, along with along with Roy um, and I had two or three years there. So you Palace. actually you actually played in the junior programs with uh, with Roy Packham at Palace. Yeah, so I, I uh, I'm trying to think now. It was the Falcons and the Eagles and whatever else it is they called the Mark. So I was with Mark. I went up as a sort of gangly 14 year old, I think, and would would join in with with sort of both age groups. Um, and it it definitely helped accelerate and and uh, sort of increase the interest in the game. We'd go up to twice or three times a week, and then games. Dad, you know, mum or dad would drive me up and. That was before the motorway was there, so it was you know it was a painstaking journey all the way up to Palace from Folkestone. Um, but I continued to play at Folkestone, and and that, that group of guys they had some you know Mickey Fisher, um, Mark Harding, and and Nimi Sandu, people that were sort of standouts in in that Kent area that had played National League basketball, John Lingham, um, and, and that really helped because I played adult basketball at a really young age um, and, and sort of just helped accelerate the process for me. And so you, 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 you were going up uh, on a weekly basis. Um, I think you got involved in national junior programs pretty early as well. Is that right? Yeah. So I played, I played, uh, so I ended up playing uh, for the England under 15 team, ended up captaining that team. Um, and I don't, I, Stephen Hurd was in that team with me, and uh, and I, I, it's hard to remember names because a lot of them never really continue to play. Sure. Um, but we played at the Aston Villa Centre on carpet, and uh, so I did that, and then was with the Seventeens with Humph and Chris, and I ended up moving to Lofts, uh, Lofts Travel for um, a year or so, just because of the distance and it was nearer. Um, but I ended up playing on, on those national teams and those were, you know, obviously great experiences in terms of just solidifying my, you know, as any kid, I played a lot of rugby and cricket and county stuff with that. And it just solidified my, my real love for basketball. Dad played when he was younger and was a fanatic about basketball as well as rugby. And, and um, it all just came to, you know, came together early success in terms of playing at a school level and a county level and then a national team level. Um, and then that's what drove me to go to the States at, you know, 16 after finishing, you know, O levels here. So you went to high school, uh, and then subsequently to, to college. I mean, this is a lot of basketball, um, experience for, for a young British person. And specifically you've been touched by a lot of good coaches already. Um, what about your experiences in America at high school and college? 
So I, I, I ended up going to a uh, um, Don Bosco Tech in downtown Boston. It was right in the middle of the red light district. Um, and it was, so it was a really unique experience in terms of just transitioning from a seaside town in Kent to a, uh, you know, a, a downtown environment in, in Boston. And I ended up doing three years there. Um, and that was always the plan. I went in as a sophomore I, and I ended up living with a guy that, a guy called Jack McMahon who lived with, uh, who Martin Clark had lived with prior to going to uh, Boston College. Martin had played at Don Bosco as well. Um, and things didn't really work out. Jack helped in many ways, played in a lot of summer leagues. I was playing in Roxbury in the summer, which um, was was invaluable. Um, you know, started to be involved with Bay State team games and stuff like that. And then it did, that situation just didn't really work. And I came back and uh, I wasn't actually wasn't going to go back. Um, didn't enjoy that first year, just the home life side of it, and uh, had started looking at other careers, police or the army, or, you know, maybe going back to school and my high school coach guy called John Grady, uh, an Irishman from Boston, a family of four and, um, just said, come live with us. So I ended up going back for my senior, my junior and senior year in high school and, uh, had a, you know, had a great, amazing, uh, opportunities, um, you know, that came out of that and never really, I didn't at the time, never really understood the system. Um, and I think, you know, now had I known more, I was, I was already 3000 miles away from home and I had some opportunities to go and, uh, offers to go to schools on the West coast. And it just seemed like, you know, it's 6,000 miles away from home. And at that time, you know, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have computers were, you know, so it just seemed like a, a million miles away from your family and the, this fairy tale, in, you know, sort of situation where your parents are going to come watch you play. Well, my parents came and watched me play once and right. uh, when I was in college. And, you know, to this day, I regret maybe not exploring those West Coast opportunities, but I ended up playing at UNH. I had injuries and was back and forth, but, you know, enjoyed my career there and ended up playing for a guy called Jerry Friel for the first two years, who was an exceptional human being, um, had been a tremendous coach and just had, you know, had found it really hard in the last number of years before I got there to, to recruit. And then he was replaced by a guy called Jimmy Boyle. And Jimmy's been, was one of the lead assistants at Chicago for many years. And we've remained close. Um, and that whole experience, um, I mean, you can always probably say you could do, do more and do better with it, but it was, a, it was an awesome experience. And then I came back to the U UK and um, ended up going back to Palace, really. Um, had explore, was exploring opportunities to go and play in Europe. And of course, at that time, it was, it was more difficult. So sure. the rules were different. Um, and basically Roy had reached out and said, you know, we're rekindling and re restarting the palace program. And, um, you know, he sold it and it was, you know, I ended up spending, I think six or seven years there with him and then, uh, uh with him around with uh, Jim Walsh was coaching for the first part and then Alton obviously took over. So, yeah. uh, yeah, palace through and through. So, uh, uh, is there any time in this period, you know, all through your playing, you know, and you're obviously you're coming back to the UK, um, you know, in your, I'm assuming you started, you enrolled to, to be in, in teacher training at that moment, or what, how did that happen um, to get into teaching? Yeah. But the question more is, so I, about, you know, with all of this, um, was there any thoughts about coaching at any time? Did you think that that was a route that you wanted to go? Because, you know, obviously you've been involved with quite a lot of coaches up until that moment. Sure. I, um, so I came back and I, I uh, went to Borough Road, West London. Uh, you know, Andy Powson and Graham were there. And um, the reason for that was you know, just at the time, it was really semi-professional basketball wherever, you know, you'd go unless you got yeah. to Europe and stuff. And I, I wanted to play. I had had the injuries with knees and whatever, but I wanted to come back and I wanted an opportunity to play more. And ultimately that's, you know, I ended up playing with Palace and then um, was, was involved with the England program at a time where there was an abundance of players. Um, and then ended up playing for Wales and then played for the GB select group with Laszlo. Um, and 
I, I always knew I wanted to be involved with basketball in a full-time capacity in terms of playing or coaching. But unfortunately, England is one of those places in the world where you, and I think, you know, with the exception of probably a handful of people now in, in the country, you, you still have to supplement, supplement your basketball obsession with a full-time job. So I ended up teaching because that was what would allow me to continue to play and then obviously get involved. And at one point I was, I was playing, um, I was teaching and I was coaching the, you know, county and then regional teams, you know, the, those regional teams with, um, you know, around the time of when really when Richard Midgley and people like that were starting to come on the scene and obviously, you know, Richard was with you and everything at, at at London Towers. So I've always had that desire to coach and or teach. Um, and for me, it was always, it was just an opportunity to do it. I, it. And I don't know now, I have been out of British basketball, the environment there, but I, I still get the feeling that for the majority of people, there's no way that you can do it as a full-time coach. Yeah. And, I mean, there's, and, there, and there it's is... disappointing that we're, you know, we're, you know, nearly 20 years on and it, it hasn't, hasn't really changed. No. Um, and, and I mean, to do the job correctly, you need to be doing it full time. Yeah. And, that, uh, that's a great point. It, you know, that's, that's the, it's a disappointment for me is that there are some talented coaches we've talked about before and we'll talk about again, as we come through, um, that just never been afforded the opportunity to do it properly. And mm -hmm. ha have they, you know, had they been given the opportunity, or still given the opportunity to do that, then um, I think British basketball potentially could be in a better place. Yeah, I mean, we'll 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 take we'll pick up on that point um, shortly. Um, what? Um, so now you're you're in, you start to get yourself into your teacher teacher role. Um, you you start towards the end of this playing career. And you start, you know, like you said, you're coaching these regional teams. What was kind of like the tipping point and where did you see, actually, you know, I, I really do have a, a talent for this and I really think that I can be, um, you know, I can do more. What, what was that? What was that real, that point that you felt was the, the time that that happened? I, when I was playing at Palace, there was, you know, I got hurt and there was an opportunity to help Alton. Um, and I was also doing some stuff with some of the junior teams at the time. And, um, I think it was just that feeling and that opportunity that you could help drive things. And, you know, my, you know, my philosophy, you know, has it changed and we'll come to that as well, but has, has very much, has been pretty much the same all the way through. It's obviously adapted in terms of certain things that, you, you know, you, you approach it and how you deal with it. But, um, I think my time at palace made me realize, you know, I got hurt and, um, I got divorced in 2006 and I'd always wanted the opportunity to, to coach more. And my frustration was that, you know, you'd have to travel to London or, um, and there was no, I would have left teaching had there been a full-time opportunity to sure. do basketball and that for whatever reason, that opportunity in the UK never presented itself. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we'll get to that point in terms of creating opportunities, not only for myself, but for more importantly for young British players. Um, and so when 2006 came along and I'd been working with national teams and I, you know, made some connections, the opportunity presented itself to go to Spain. Um, and it, you know, Spain turned out to be a little different to what I had was, was probably going to expect expecting it to be in terms of just the way that it was managed and what was going on. But that was mm. probably, you know, part of being a turning point, knowing I wanted to do it, but then finding that opportunity and seizing that opportunity would have been, you know, 2006, 2007 when, um, coach, just, when just, the um, just explain that situation. I think it's really important because, um, I'm going to ask you later on about, you know, your advice to younger coaches to, you know, talk about the international route, you know, I still credit you as, you know, one of the trailblazers of, of, of British coaches, you know, internationally, you know, you were one of the first coaches to make this, you know, push. And so it, here you are in 2006, you go to Spain, explain the situation. Cause it's, it's not just your run of the mill Academy or your run of the mill situation. This is, you know, super elite level. 
Yeah, I mean, we, you know, I made a connection with with Rob Ariana, and uh, um, you know, unfortunately, things with Rob and I didn't transpire. We 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 digressed on certain things. Um, you know, and I look back at it now. Rob Rob was a was definitely a, a trailblazer in terms of what he, how he approached things and what he thought about. And the experience was a remarkable experience. We had an opportunity to work with some high level players. Obviously, Ryan ended up out in in Spain, although not connected to the academy. But you know, Joel had been out there, and um, it really opened your eyes in terms of how you know, what career, a career in basketball, you know, what it looks like, the day-to-day running of it, the intensity, the hours, the thing, and doing it for no, next to no money. Mm. And that for me was the biggest thing. I, 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 I took a, I, I, an, an opportunity presented itself and I took that opportunity and it wasn't based on, on money and it wasn't, it was based on, on what was presented as a British coach. That was, the opportunity I had been looking for to to grow and expand, and you know, I've grown a lot over the last fifteen years. And you know, I've been around some great people, had some great opportunities, um, and you know, going from from England to to being involved with the academy, you know, was, was pretty raw. And you know, happily open to admit that. Um, and, and just to explain, that's CBA, which is you know, that's was still one of the biggest. Uh, talent academies in you know certainly in europe and uh has produced yeah. multiple um international players uh euro league players and, and nba players Absolutely. So, yeah and they've done a tremendous job in terms of moving it forward you know, yeah. he's you know credit to rob and he stuck with it he had a vision we both had a vision and um you know it he he's pursued it you know some of it wasn't to my liking and you know the way that it's done but um he he you know he's continued to, pro- to to progress with that and has has created something that many many clubs or academies aspire to be and at this time uh had you um because obviously you were part of the england national junior setup um you know you had been doing a lot of uh kind of mm-hmm. you know helping with those programs and then getting yourself through those systems what what were you around this time were you the under 16 national team coach what was the situation there i think it was under 18s at that under time 18s. i had um it might have been sixteens. I can't. The timeline gets a little blurry with all the stuff that's yeah. gone on. But you know, I had an opportunity to uh, basically initially work with Rick Woolridge, uh, was the first head coach in national teams that I worked with. And then um, from being with Rick, I went to the under sixteens as a head coach. And then I had an opportunity to work with Dave Titmus as an assistant with the eighteens. Um, and then had an opportunity to become the head coach of the eighteens. And then from there, obviously moved on to being the twenty with the twenties for for a number of years. Um, so let's, uh, let, let's just let's just hold it, hold it, hold it there, and let me ask you another question. Up until this kind of two thousand and six, two thousand and seven um, area, and then we start getting involved, um, you know, a little bit after that, and your whole career starts taking off in a different in a different sphere. Who were your biggest influences up until that moment? Um, and did you have someone that you felt was a mentor or, you know, someone that you were, you know, looking towards, you know, like, hey, I'm going to start, you know, taking some of that philosophy on board? Was, were there a set of coaches that, you know, really influenced you, you know, for, for the early part of your career? You know, I, I was lucky enough to, to be around uh, Humph and Chris Morgan. And, you know, both of them very different characters. Humph um, was very old school um, in his approach, but at the same time was um, was sort of advanced in terms of where basketball ball was. Humph had always wanted to play fast and quick, and you know, with pace and you know, extend the floor, play with pressure, and those are the things that I'd always loved about basketball in terms of when I started coaching. So. Um, Humph and Chris were were definitely sort of people that at the very beginning of my career helped um, 
in my coaching direction. I mean, Mark Dunning was was ultimately helped me, and Roy were responsible for helping me uh, move forward with being in um, in the states and really sort of buying into that. Uh, you know, both of those visited my house in Folkestone and helped with the direction and the introduction to Mark and Chris, Clark and things. But the coaching direction would have come early on from Humph um, Interesting. Uh, and Chris in terms of the, that junior level, obviously being around Southeast England and looking at how, how we, you know, played in the regional stuff. Um, and then there was a void. It, you know, I got to that point where, you know, the BBL, Chris and obviously Nick were, were coaching in the BBL at, at that time, but um, there wasn't, you know, it wasn't really a, a lot of people. I, I think it was more, I had opportunities to be around, like I was around Laszlo and, you know, you took some stuff that Laszlo did and, uh, you know, around, around, um, you know, Dave Titmus and, you know, you'd take some of the stuff that Dave did and, and then obviously the way that, that Rick sort of ran a program in his sort of very sort of reserved nature and manner of, uh, you know, about things. So there was a, co a collective of people that uh, I guess contributed, but I, for me, it was a lot of it was, I would watch basketball and I would, I determine myself, this is, this is what I like about it. This is what I, you know, I, I want to do. Um, and way before I, you know, as we move forward down the line, I mean, Nick and Chris have been, you know, Chris especially um, have been very influential in, sure. in just adapting my philosophy and um, the way that I want to play. But, uh, you know, just watching and then sort of implementing and adapting. I've always, always, as you have, you wanted to play quicker and in a way that we're playing the game now, not drawn out in the half court and, um, you know, really developing players that know and understand how to play basketball. So um, I think those people were key. And then, you know, college was difficult because it, I didn't, you know, I got hurt and didn't play as much as I'd like to have done. Um, and then ultimately I played with Alton and Alton was um, played with him. And then he was obviously coaching it. And, you know, Alton's just perception of the game and vision of the game was, was eye-opening in terms of just the things that, that he did. So, you know, he, he definitely had, uh, again, you know, small pieces of that puzzle get put together by a number of individuals. I wouldn't say there was, you know, one person. I think you take things from a variety of people um, and you build those or put them together, piece them together to develop your philosophy as you move forward. So uh, yeah. I, I wouldn't say there was, there was one particular person that I would attribute it to. After CBA, um, what was the next stop? Um, what what was the next move? Uh, what what was the, the the link then to? The so we uh, we came back. I came back to the UK and um, really wasn't sure what direction I wanted to go in and. I'd always had a frustration that having worked with so many of the youth through the national teams and, and regional teams that oftentimes there were some, there would be players that, you know, potentially had uh, the, the ability to play at, you know, high levels, but were never afforded the opportunity to play in the UK. You know, the, the BBL would have a handful of people, but we always seem to just, they, you know, missing out the loop that they just, there was a section, there was a, uh, a part of that progression for British basketball for younger players that was just missing. And, uh, it was, it was at the same time that the, the ACE program sort of started to kick off. And, uh, I came back from, from Spain and I, having seen what was going on there and ha there were a number of British children that had players that had come over you know why why was it we couldn't provide the opportunity to to um to do the same for them in the uk and obviously ace came in and that created an opportunity to create an academic environment and an academy and then we created the bbl and you know for whatever reason we got you know a lot of stick about creating that program um the intent was never 
um, early on, I mean, to, to win the BBL, the, the intent was always, as stated, to, to give British players that clearly had an opportunity to play at a higher level uh, the opportunity to play. And uh, we made the decision not to hire Americans. We had a couple of Aussies that were British passport holders and, again, would, you know, would benefit from being in a system. Um, and, uh, you know, it, was, it wasn't an easy you know, three years in terms of doing it, but I felt that it was uh, a very successful program. Um, and had we been able to continue uh, the progression, we had an opportunity, we had uh, something on the table to try and move, move everything to London, very similar to what has happened since we've, we've left. Mm. Um, I think that we potentially could have had something that would have been, uh, would have grown and created. You know, and that's with everything in the UK. I mean, I invested my own money in it. Sure. Um, we had we had some great sponsors that were with us. And then when we were rejected out of the London scenario, um, you know, those that, that those people decided that, that, you know, there was, I think, like a lot of times, they just didn't see the value in being involved in British basketball at that's that time in terms of the progression of it. Again, um, you know, your, your modesty is obviously, you know, um, coming through. Let, let's, let's explain, you know, you set up the Essex Pirates. Um, I mean, for sure, you know, four of those players, um, you know, went on to, you know, really, well, incredible careers in some ways. Um, so please explain, you know, the four that were, you know, the, the, of that first cohort. Yeah, I mean... We obviously I'd been involved with the under twenties and could see that there were some talented children, ta talented players that um, we could either send them to the U.S. really into an unknown, not knowing what would happen, would they develop, would they play, or we could put them in an environment. And believe me, I mean, I'll, I, you know, I'm the first one to say that w w was it perfect in terms of what we had with everything at the Pirates? No, no, it wasn't. Um, but it was a, a process in terms of moving that forward. Um, but, you know, most notably, we, we had uh, Miles Hessen, Jamel Anderson, um, Zach Gachette, and um, Colin Singh were the four mainstays. We had um, a number of younger players who were within the academy, and the plan had we moved forward was the next year they would then be involved coming out of... Mm -hmm out of high school here, high school or college. Um, so the intention was for those guys just to play, to have give them a to, to highlight and ultimately for them, you know, if it was for a club that, you know, whether it be Leicester or whether it was Everton or where they can move on to a better environment where they can get paid, you know, where they can actually fulfill, you know, the opportunity that presents itself or you live up to, the, the, the sort of standing that they clearly had the ability to do. Um, and that was, that was it first and foremost was to, to give the, these players an opportunity to play and to show the rest of the country that we have players here that are more than capable, but you have to invest in them and you have to, you have to believe in them and you have to take time to develop them. And, 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 I, and, and, uh, and I have to say that, if, you know, these minus there are very very few players that have been produced and are playing in the bbl at this moment or in europe or even on a higher level um that have been homegrown and you for sure you know have taken a number of the only other player i can that that comes to mind directly who's really you know a top, has been a top player is darius defoe um, you know, really and truthfully, everyone else has had an American experience. And here you have these players, especially, obviously, Miles Hessen, which was an incredible um, spot and in that development. I mean, did you, were you enjoying, you must have enjoyed that experience of working on the floor every single day. That must have been the, the thing that was, you know, the, the, the best situation for you. Absolutely. I mean, we had a great group of of you know young men involved with the program and uh it was you know it was high, uh, highly rewarding to see their improvement and their you know the, the growth in their confidence you know we you know as an organization we can't 
you know, Jamel came out of Dougie, you know, initially, you know, Jamel was around Dougie and, you know, so Dougie has to take a considerable credit for Jamel's formative, you know, years. Uh, Miles was in Birmingham, you know, sure. and he was around programs in Birmingham. And we, I think what we, you know, Colin was in Liverpool and with, um, uh, with Toxic. Mr. Mooney. Uh, yeah, with Henry. Uh, yeah, yeah, with Henry. And, um, you know, Zach was at East London. And credit needs to be given to the people that, you know, brought <clears throat> brought them into the game and, and, and just gave them the opportunity to start. And we, we all we did was we, we I think we, we saw the opportunity to provide them or for, for them a window to really showcase themselves and prove that we, we are capable of producing young, talented British players. Um, not to go the route of just taking these ready-made from somewhere else and supplement them at the, at the expense of what we wanted to do. Mm. So I felt that we, we just, we basically were a continuation of what those coaches from those areas had done with those players and they couldn't find, or they couldn't provide that opportunity. And I think that's what I, what we tried to do. Um, and we, you know, results were, were not what was no, driving us. Absolutely. It, it was clear. It was, you know, and if we had gone another five years and we only ever won five games, but we had players that had been given the opportunity to be exposed. Jamel's had an opportunity to go and play in, in Australia. He's been at, in Spain. He's been, you know, miles is doing incredibly well in, in, in France. Um, to me, it's a success. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's important to say that, uh, would you say that now 2008 um, was when we started working for each other? Would you say that this was a was a big turning point, you know, in, in your career when, you know, uh, Chris Finch obviously, you know, calls us both to be, be his assistants on the first GB team? um yep. that was assembled uh would you say that that was a was a was a big turning point or i mean because obviously he's had such an influence on both of both of our careers um in in so many ways yeah i think i, I probably would go back a couple of years I th it was actually when i first took over the men the under 20 program after jeff um and we I think that's when, for me, things really started to take a, a shape in terms of um, I had an opportunity to go to Commonwealth Games in 2006, 2007 in, uh, right. in, in Melbourne. Um, so that was one of the first things. But the under-20s was definitely a turning point, I think, because it, what it did is it put you in contention with teams in Europe and we and we beat teams. I mean, we we competed really well. We should have, you know, they changed the rules one year. We missed out by a game, um, you know, to get to the A division. You know, and we it was just it was hurdles. But what I did, what I felt was that it put not only me but the players in a a position of oh, British basketball can compete at this level, mm -hmm. and oh, he could coach at this level, or he can, and that I think definitely helped me moving forward in terms of the, my, the, you know, just the performances we had in Europe in terms of playing, uh, beating certain teams, and then ultimately being involved with the GB program, being invited in, you know, when you were with Chris uh, to be part of that um, was a, was obviously an eye opener to work at that level. Um, it's obviously strengthened your resume in terms of when other teams now started to look at you. Um, and obviously, you know, through that period, um, uh, we, you know, the um, pirates and I was in Spain or whatever, that combination of all that stuff then helped for the next step in terms of once the Olympics had come and gone in terms of then having a window to go and coach sure. overseas. Yeah. And that, um, that, that step 
was a, a really interesting step. So, you, you know, you you obviously went through the whole. I mean, is there anything you want to you know talk about with, regard, with with the GB cycle, with the Olympic cycle? I mean, um, we're, we're we're two of the people that are that are in there. Um, Coach McKesky obviously is uh, over in America at the moment, and then the other two guys uh, happen to be now on the same team. Um, so one's an NBA champion. It's funny how life works out. Um, any, yeah. and, and any any thoughts on on that process um i mean you know the whole the whole gb process was a, an incredible experience um you know from start to finish in terms of being involved with the 20s program um there you know i give a lot of credit as my as i moved as i move forward warwick can definitely became a mentor to me in terms of you know, approach to coaching and stuff and was influential in, in really making you open your eyes and think about different ways and methods, as was Chris Spice. You know, Chris was very good in terms of, you know, talking about how, lead, you, know, you know, developing leadership groups and, uh, you know, styles of coaching and, and things like that. So I think I was extremely fortunate enough to be in, involved right from the start with, um, you know, Chris um, and, and then Warwick. Um, who had come from an Australian background. Chris was obviously hockey, but a background, and, and Warwick was from basketball, but a background of sporting excellence in terms of developing coaches. And I thought, I think I, I, I look back at that and, and, you know, feel very lucky to have been involved or had the opportunity to, to, to experience and learn from them and be guided by them. So, you know, I do look at Warwick at times as, as, as a mentor in my latter years and in, in involved in all that stuff. Yeah. And I continue to remain in contact with Warwick. Um, I, you know, I felt he, he was, ex I thought he did a lot for British basketball that maybe he didn't, didn't get always for. get enough credit for. Mm. Um, I, you know, his, he, he had a great approach to the game. Um, he was a basketball man through and through, and he was an educator. Um, so, you know, I felt, you know, that was one side of it. And then the opportunities that Chris obviously afforded me to be, you know, and my role varied as yours did, you know, we were both flexible. We would do whatever was needed by the team, uh, whether it was, you know, on the bench scouting, you know, and that again was invaluable in terms of moving forward and understanding what, what you need to do to be a professional coach. Sure. And did you, uh, what, what did you, did you change? Did you feel, you know, working with Chris that you, you know, started to change your philosophy on, you know, how you taught offense or how you taught defense? Was there, was there stuff that you, you know, really changed at that time? Yeah. I mean, I'd always, I have always had the philosophy of, you know, playing with pace and tempo and, um, You've always been a motion offense guy, an open I've offense always guy. always been, yeah. And so a lot of what Chris did made a lot of sense right away. And um, But, I mean, ultimately the answer to that question is yes, of course. I mean, working with two guys like Nick and Chris and, and Paul. Paul was my assistant. Paul was with, incredible. You know, yeah. the under 20s. Um, you can't help not modify and think and think. I mean, Chris is an, um, you know, highly intellectual um man and you know the thought that goes the game you know both of them nick is you know both geniuses in terms of the way the game is now being played and you know at the forefront of what what's happening so absolutely they you know it's the stuff that they talked about and how they did it and um was was influential as you move forward like i said you know earlier it's there's these pocket windows you know pockets that you go through and you pick up things with people that you work with. And, uh, you know, as, as my time has gone on, you know, both of, I've been, you know, I've been privileged enough to be around both of them, uh, a lot. Um, and, you know, absolutely they've helped shape and, and drive and move forward your, your thinking and philosophies about how the game's played or, or how you're going to coach. Okay. From the Olympic games, you, you went to Germany, um, yeah. you know, 
uh, you obviously, you know, talk a little bit about that process and what were some of the things that, you know, you saw there and, uh, you know, that were really, you know, started to, to un, you know, to get you to understand what, what that level was, you know, going to be in Europe and sure. the rest of the world. You know, I left the, left the Olympics not knowing really what, you know, what was going to, going to happen. I touched sort of my feet touched down in the BBL briefly again, and it wasn't necessarily the best experience. Um, and really didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and believe me, like trying to convince teams in Europe to hire a British coach that's never coached professionally overseas is not an easy task. And unfortunately the younger coaches that you know now coach in England and have aspirations to, to move overseas uh it's not you know I I you know I don't envy them it's it, it's a hard place to be um, do, do you so, have, do you have a just before you answer the next question about Germany do you, do, you, do you, let me pick up on that point um I'm very passionate about a point we you know we talk about it all of the time um you, would you have done something different is there a, is there a, is there something that you would have done differently? Because I know for a fact that it, what I know now, I would have used our contacts to go and put myself as the third assistant on a Euro League team or a Euro Cup team or Champions League team, yeah. um, and and work my way through the system there because I think that's really the 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 way forward. Do do you feel that, or do you just feel you know again it's it's a lack of respect for British coaches and it's a really un, uneven playing field? I think. Uh... There's, there's definitely a lack of respect. I mean, you know, the first thing somebody says when, you know, when they find out you're British, you're like, you coach basketball. Like, I mean, it's like they play basketball in England. I mean, that's the first question that people or statement people make. Um, there's no doubt that in any professional sport, it's about networking in terms of knowing people that can open opportunities and doors, but you have to back yourself and you, you have to, you can't, just take on jobs because somebody gives you an opportunity. You have to be proved that you're good enough to do that. And you have to be prepared to work and you have to be prepared to do it for very little money. Um, and you have to be prepared to do that for five to 10 years. Um, I had started that process. Like I had, you know, obviously, the, you know, the thing in Spain and then come back here, but there was poss there was an opportunity possibly to go out to Rio Grande with Chris and work there. It just, but, you know, visas and stuff. It was, you know, everything. And then this opportunity came up in Germany and, and obviously Torsten was a, an assistant for Chris. Uh, Torsten then coached in Edinburgh. Um, and I simply sent Torsten an email and said, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm doing. I would like to, to coach overseas and I will come and do it for no nothing. I, I'm just, I'm ha I just want the opportunity. And, you know, we talked back and forth and then an opportunity arose in, in Germany to go and coach what was their Pro B team, Region and Liga, and then also work with the, uh, the Bundesliga team. And, uh, I mean, I didn't even see the contract. I said yes. You know, it was because it was an opportunity to, to finally get your foot in the door and do something. And I've always believed that if you give me the opportunity, you know, I'm going to back myself and you're going to like what you get you got to convince people to do that so that's what i did you know and i basically ended up going out there they they were a phenomenal club to work for um Ratia farm home uh unbelievable management group obviously torsten you know torsten basically just opened the door and said you do what you need to do and we would you know torsten and i would meet we'd talk about philosophy i'd help with you know and I had an opportunity around their practices and player development and then running all the junior stuff. And there's a number of those junior players now that have moved on and play are playing either at Ratsy Farm or are playing at a higher level. Yeah. You know, Daniel Tice was on my pro B team. Unbelievable. You know, Unbelievable. You know and, and he then moved on. And I'm, you know, I'm, I don't take the credit for the development of Daniel Tice. He was there for whatever. But that, like, that's like, the level like, of player. Like I don't take the, the, the credit for Paul Zipser as well. <laughs> Exactly. So, you know, it just, you know, but that, that, that explained 
the level and the organization that Germany had in terms of their development for basketball in the country. And, and um, you know, did you, did you feel that that was the first time that you were immersed in this, you know, higher, uh, I mean, you obviously you're with Chris and uh, Nick and the GB team and us, you know, we were all together in the summers, but it was that the first time you felt, you know, Hey, this is really high level and I'm being Absolutely. challenged to get better. Um, I'm not uh, yeah. just going through the paces, you know, like I, I can, no, it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was the first time to be thrown into a full on full-time professional environment. I'd always felt that I had a professional approach to whatever we did anyway, whether it was regional teams, whether it was national teams, whether it was, so I wasn't, it wasn't something I got there and thought, holy cow, like this is, like I felt that I belonged there. Um, I didn't feel out of depth. Um, I think that obviously being around, you know, you guys in the summer and having had an opportunity to do stuff through Essex and then national teams, you know, it allowed you to develop a philosophy in the way that you want to do things. And like I said to you before, Warwick and those guys had helped, you know, guide you. But in terms of like financial support facilities, you know, transportation, like it was like nothing else, you know, it doesn't come, doesn't even come, come there's no comparison to, to what we have in the UK. And, um, and the way that they manage the players, you know, the way that they were, they were buying players and selling players um, to bring them into programs from wherever that may be. Um, so it was the first, you know, definitely the first um, experience of a fully professional um, situation, you know, and I mean, you look at Ratsy Farm now, I mean, they, they're building an orange campus. They've got a brand new arena. I mean, just a phenomenal organization phenomenal organization from germany which is one of the most professional leagues in europe you then go even to a potentially even more professionalism you know and you go to japan um talk quickly about uh, that experience um going to tokyo and uh coaching um in in the b league there so i uh um the opportunity came out of the blue i mean i'd done uh, so like I say, you know, I think you've always got to be prepared to back yourself. And I backed myself in Germany and we, we did, an, an, which I think is, we did a really good job in terms of developing the players. We won, nobody expected us to win. We were playing in the pro B against, you know, seasoned professionals that had dropped down with young kids and we were winning and we got to the, to the, uh, um, you know, the, the end of the year and we, we were competitive. I think we got finals or finals. I had semis or yeah, finals. I can't, I can't remember what we got to. Um, and, uh, you know, Miles had joined us. You know, Miles had joined us. He was sort of at a, at a point in his career where he didn't know there was no direction. No. And uh, trying to convince Thomas Stoll and, and these guys that there's a kid in England at 6'5 that could come and play here and could potentially pr- and could practice with the BBL. I mean, it probably went two or three weeks and they wouldn't you know. And so we brought miles in and they saw him one practice and they were like, we're signing them. So, um, that, that whole year, uh, in terms of the development of players and the progression, um, there's a guy, John Patrick, who runs Ludwigsburg, who you all know, um, I got a phone call from John Patrick, who I'd known from working Nike camps, uh, you know, years gone back, um, was coaching at Lewisburg and he reached out and he said, listen, I got a job in Japan. He said, I think you'd be a great fit having watched what you've done this year with the players. Would you be interested? I didn't even ask what the money was. I didn't, I didn't, I had, to, I'm telling you to this day, I can't even tell you what was in the contract. Like it was. I said, I just immediately said yes, because it was an opportunity for me now again to grow. And I didn't care about what the money was. Um, all I wanted was an opportunity to step up the next rung of the coaching opportunities. And, uh, you know, Japan is, you've, you've worked there. Japan's an interesting country in terms of, it, you know, and you very much reliant on a translator. Sure. And then, and then people within the organization that, that you feel you can trust. And 
you know, I, I had a great experience in Japan. And we were, we, we sort of teetered on the edge of being really good. And then we just never quite got to that point. We could never get over the, the tipping point. And there was a lot of, you know, uh, politics stuff going on at the club. It was a, it was a, it was a uh, company team. Um, but the experience in Japan in order to now expand your level of coaching and, you know, just organization and preparation and uh, was invaluable, you know, it was totally invaluable. And, uh, you know, Japan is one of the one of the few countries I would definitely go back and uh, and work in and and have an opportunity to to do it. I've since been back as a consultant to to work with one of the top women's teams. Sure. Um, but uh, again, you know, you got to back would, yourself and take those opportunities that present it. And that was more because you know you're getting a lot of repetitions on the floor. You're getting repetitions in the games. Um, are you starting to change, you know, some of your coaching habits, co you know, philosophy at that time? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, you, you know, adjusting how you run practices or length of practices or, you know, developing drills that pertain to the philosophy that you have and stuff that you want to run. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's more breakdowns and things. And, and obviously the way we played was not very Japanese um yeah and you've been there and you know you understand what that means and you know the japanese players want to be told what to do each Definitely. section of of your possession and suddenly for them to be given some freedom and to run open and you know we're running early stuff and only running uh you know dead ball situations or when we really need to sets and stuff was a real shift in culture for them and uh, it's it's been really interesting because of course Lamas has come in with the men's national team and he's starting to do more and more of that and as as you watch Japanese especially the top leagues in Japan you see now there's a lot more freedom in the game players Definitely. are starting to read and react and and stuff so I thought we were you know we were actually probably a little ahead of uh, sure. I say a little ahead of our time but had it been a year or two later and they you know there was this sort of they they uh, accepted that the game was moving forward, then we may have been in a better position. But uh... I also I also think that um, now, from me being there, um, I mean it's culturally and and also understanding the tempo and of that league because it's it's really hard to you know anyone you know I went there believing that um, oh I coached in the BBL I know how to coach back to backs but. When you have to go Saturday and Sunday, Saturday and Sunday, and then a Wednesday thrown in between, and then a Saturday and Sunday, that's a completely different rhythm, and uh, you have to develop a whole different strategy to, you know, how you prepare your team throughout the week yeah. and the rest aspects, and all those others. So, I mean, I think, I think uh, there's no question that being around the BBL prepares you for um, many of the challenges that you may face elsewhere because. You you know you do face challenges in the BBL, BBL with money and transportation, and accommodation, and players and salaries and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that you know the level of the Japanese league is consider you know is considerably higher in terms of all of that stuff. Mm. Um, and I would say going back, and I think you know Chris, yourself, Nick would all put their hands up and agree that having been around the bbl environment one of the benefit one of the i think one of the biggest benefits is that it having to to deal with the day-to-day -day things that you would have to deal with in the bbl and you know this because you were in it long term puts you in a position where when i can't you know we're we're, we're going to travel by you know sleep a train instead of a of a flight like Dude, you have no idea. I used to travel by minibuses up and down the motorway <laughs> to the Newcastle. Like, yeah. no, I thought like it just I thought when you rang me one day and uh, when we were talking and you said, um, you know, we're staying in the hotel um, before our home game, and I said, no, 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 what you you're away, and you said, no, 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 we're yeah. at home, and I was yeah. like, what what's this guy talking about? And now you know, obviously, yeah. I understand. You know. You, you know, money is no object, and uh, yeah. you know the, the 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 players arrive in in peak uh, peak scenario. I mean, we were we would travel one hour, less than an hour to Tokyo, 
and go the day before the day before the game and stay in a hotel. It's, you know, it's crazy. So. so I think, I think for the likes, you know, for, like I say, for, you know, Chris, Nick, you, me, people that have coached and then moved on to environments in Europe where people look at it and think, look, we're really sorry. We can't do this, but you know, this, the BBL prepares you for that. I mean, there's nothing, there is no challenge too great when you move forward in coaching um because of the you know the restrictions you face and that you know that's just unfortunately that's part of the league it doesn't have the money that you have elsewhere and the budget and you know so when i think that's also something that helps when you go and coach at these environments overseas and you're you know you get serbian coaches that are jumping up and down the sideline because they don't have something or whatever and you're like and your your approach is hey no problem i'll deal with having four guys tonight for practice or you know, seven guys for practice because it's become part of what you've done for 15 years. You were coached in the BBL and you've experienced it all. Yeah. So I think that makes you harder um, and just uh, more resilient to, 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 to being taking these jobs. So. From Japan, uh, you go to the what was the D League and it's now the G League. Um, yeah. Incredible. Uh, I think just one point I want to make to the audience first. Um, it's embarrassing that I have to uh, go through this and explain, um, and you have to explain where you were, um, considering this is, we're talking about the MBA D-League, you know, and that's something that, um, you know, as a, as a, as a, a basketball culture, we have to change. Um, I, I'm pretty certain if you did this now, I would think that Mark Woods and, and, and Hoops Fix and Sam would pick up on this and maybe make it a story. But um, anyway, do, you can take it away and say um, you went to the D-League um, and uh, what was your first stop there? So I was uh, basically hired by Phoenix to um, be part of uh, the, the G League team in Bakersfield, which is now defunct. It sort of got it got moved to Northern Arizona. Northern Arizona has sold it to D Detroit and you know, whatever. So uh, a fan, an unbelievable experience for you know the year working with uh, um, you know high level players that were sent down. Um, high level players that were in the program trying to get back. Uh, you know, we made it, we won the showcase that year uh, in Santa Cruz. We, we uh, I think we were first at the break. Um, we're highly competitive all year, fell apart a little bit in the playoffs. Um, but and again, another level, you know, like even though it was a G League, I mean, there was, you know, no expense spared in terms of travel, accommodation, you know, when you would do it at a lower level. In terms, you know, it's not, you know, you're not staying at five star hotels, but you're, everything done was done super professionally and you're dealing with high level players. You're learning to deal, you know, one on one and have relationships with those players. Um, and you're exposed to high level coaching day in, day out. It, not only within practice, but in the games that you play, not only with your head coach, but with head coaches from other teams in that league. Um, and then from there, um, I moved to Toronto the following year to, to the 905. And, uh, you know, worked with a guy, Jesse Murmus, who's now lead assistant at the, at the Sacramento Kings and would have an opportunity to, to work with players go in and do individual workouts. So I would, um, Andy Greer, who has been a long time Van Gundy guy was in Toronto, ran the defense and would work out Bismack with Tombo and a couple of other guys. And I would go in and work with them in the mornings and then go back to practice. And then, you know, we have games and, um, obviously, you know, we have CC players from that environment now working and playing overseas in terms of the work that you did with them. So, you know, you're exposed and you're part of an NBA organization and being in the same city in Toronto, you were regarded as, I mean, you were hired both by both teams. You're hired by the Phoenix Suns and you're hired by the Toronto Raptors. And then your remit is to help develop players for their, for their program. Sure. So phenomenal experience by being around, you know, just high level basketball. Obviously Nick was in town too. So we got a, an opportunity to spend a lot of time together to talk about basketball and, you know, you know, other things off the court, but, um, it, you know, it's, 
it's not an easy environment to to get into and again you, you know you it's for the likes of you and i it's not good enough just to be somebody's guy you have to prove that you're capable of being mm. in that environment and you know you asked earlier and i think you know the accumulation of my experience is that i had the route that i had taken taking jobs for next to no money you know opportunity over money uh has driven you know my progression all the way through um is what ultimately created the opportunity here because had i not done that other stuff i would never have been in a position to um to to uh to, to be able to sort of give technically and tactically tactically to those environments and therefore would not have been good enough to be to be involved um so say, say, saying that again though i mean first of all you know you have to have the acumen as a coach uh to take that knowledge on board and to uh put it into the correct you know way that it's taught um you know in a in a in a cohesive manner in, in a structured manner but at the same time um you know you're putting yourself on in the position you know uh, of really getting this this incredible sets of information from all of these people um that's not uh that's not something that a lot of our coaches in our country have had the opportunity to do i think um that's an important point i would like to make there yeah i think when, when if you were to look at uh, over a 20-year period of coaches that have, have taken or had the opportunity to experience uh what i have had and what you have had i'm not sure i can think of anybody that's even you know comes close to 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 doing that but i think that's also a mindset like i think one of the things that british coaches have got to overcome is i got to give up my teaching job i got to give up my nine to five job and i have to immerse myself full time in basketball and that that means i have to go back and i have to make 15000 pounds a year you know, 15,000 euros a year, then that's what that, you have to do. And, that, and I think, it's, it's, I it's, think that's, that's something that you and I share. Sure. Is that we have taken, we have been prepared that's to take gambles. that opportunity, the gambles, the risks, you backed yourself and have said, it doesn't matter where I'm from or what, who I am or what I am, I can do this. Mm. And I think, I think That's it's the biggest it, it, it's a well, I just wanted to say um actually now and and I want to make this point you know very clearly to the coaches that are listening um we have a lot of coaches now that actually do are you know residing in in basketball in such a full in a full time type way and we're talking mainly about the academy coaches we're not talking about um EBL 1 or BBL coaches but mainly the academy coaches and unfortunately they do have a really tough uh, a tough decision to make they are in full time it's a nice comfortable position likely not to be fired um likely not to lose their job or they've got to make the decision to like you said to do what you did um and to a lesser extent what i did which is to go you know and challenge yourself in in an international environment where the competition is you know considerably higher you know and we've both used the analogy that um you can either be the big fish in in, in the small pond or you're going to be the small fish in in the big pond and there's no doubt that when you're out there you went to you know you're coaching in 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 the G League which is you know the highest level in the world you know the, in minus the NBA it is the NBA um and we both coached in you know in the rest of the international world and we know it's a it's a massive pond and we're up against serbians and greeks and italians and spanish coaches and these these guys have the same knowledge base as us and they even have this you know more experience more repetition so it is tough and you've got to believe in yourself um let's yeah, move on I mean, absolutely absolutely yeah let's move on to you know the next two national team jobs um you know firstly um you moved to southeast asia uh, and thailand um, and then subsequently from the Thailand job, you, you get the, the head coach of Qatar, which, you know, in the Middle East. Talk to me about those two, two experiences. 
I mean, you know, Qatar, uh, the the Thailand job sort of just came out of the blue, really. It, it uh, and it was only going to be a summer opportunity to get them to qualify for uh, the Asian Games. Um, and I, that was the mindset I went there with. I, my intention was to go back to Toronto. Um, Jerry Stackhouse was going to be the coach. And we got to, I got to Thailand. I was there for a short period of time. We, we basically uh, finished silver in a, in the Stankovic cup uh, coming very close to beating the Philippines, which has never been done. And uh, we immediately, the organization, you know, wanted to, you know, make something more full time. And, uh, the more we listened and the more that I had was able to input in terms of what I wanted for the first time, really, in terms of, you know, dictating, this is how, you know, what I want, this is where we're going to go. And this is, and I think we can make a difference. And it became, the package just became extremely attractive for the first time, um, you know, outside of Japan, but in terms of financially. And uh, this is, what's this? This is, uh, 10 years into yeah. Yeah, 10 years, 10 years into making a decision to go to be a professional coach. And that's what I said to you earlier. It's a, it's a 10 year process. It's not, you, and I think this is something else that coaches have got to understand is you may be successful in an academy in England. You may be successful at EBL one, but believe me, the challenges when you leave the UK are vastly different to the challenges that you face, you know, where you are. And, it's not a one or two year process. You have to be prepared to do this for, I think, six to 10 years before you financially feel financially rewarded in terms of what you're doing. And for me, that's exactly what it was. It was 10 years. There was an opportunity to, to, to for some financial sort of security. Um, and, you know, so we went from there and we had, we were successful. I felt that we were really successful. We were making headway in, in uh, Thailand. We, we, we'd really done well in the competitions that we participated in. And, you know, like a lot of these countries in Asia, unfortunately politics got, you know, got in the way. Um, the, you know, the club that was overseeing it, there was a change in the Olympic committee with, you know, that they were then out of power and he wanted. So, and these are the things you, never, you know, you, you end up learning to deal with. Yeah. Um, but I think we, we set, we put a, a stamp on Southeast Asia basketball in terms of really open people's eyes in terms of the way that we could play with Thailand had never really made that push. And, uh, so I, my time finished in Thailand and I you know, taken it, we were on the cusp of, I think, changing, changing things dramatically. And unfortunately, like I say, politics got in the way of things. And I came back and I actually got an opportunity um, to go and be a consultant with the, a team in the Philippines. And at the same time was a consultant to the Philippines national team. And to me, that was a huge, uh, feather in my cap because the Philippines has always been huge. thought of within, you know, Southeast Asia, Asia, um, as a powerhouse. And here, here's Chuck Ray is asking me to come and be a consultant, um, work on, on certain things with the, with the Philippines national team. So I went there, I was there for three months got back and um while we had been in thailand we we had played qatar in the asian championships and uh you know qatar big budgets you know suppose you know rank whatever in the world and uh it goes down to we had literally we had the ball to win the game and our guard bounces the ball off his foot and uh at that time, there was a guy called Fess Irvin who was working for Qatar and six months, two, three months later, two months later, Fess calls me and says, would you be interested in the head coaching job, the way you play, the way you coach, the way that you develop these players, the progression, all the things that as a coach you aspire to really want people to appreciate for what you are. Not, not the wins, not the losses, but like all those things that he talked about in terms of moving teams forward, which ultimately put you in a position to win. And, uh, you know, whatever it was, they, they, Qatar got in touch and October I started there. And again, we, we, uh, we made huge strides in Qatar. You know, we beat, we played New Zealand, uh, beat New Zealand one out of two, um, in, 
in friendly games at home, which was which is a huge step for us in terms of the way that the program was moving. We, you know, we went to the second round of expected us to do that. We ended up playing the Philippines in the Philippines. You know, we're we're up in a position to actually solidify us an opportunity to move forward. And uh, you know, we have a team implosion with you know management and staff and, you know, and players on the floor and you know. But we were we were heading in the right direction. And again, you know, here you are in the Middle East and you're dealing with, you know, um, you want to do things in a professional manner, in the right way. And uh, and you've got your management, which are local, you know, people that have potentially played, but little knowledge. And they don't, they want, they want you to do it in a way that's comfortable and easy and they can enjoy life and go out and do things. And came to the end of my first year and they, there was no changes on what we, you know, on what we wanted to do. There was no, there was no willingness on their part to adapt and uh, make, see the program getting better. And everybody, you know, there was a lot of conversation that was going throughout that Southeast uh, or the Middle East uh, and, and Asia about how things had moved forward. And then suddenly bang, the same thing politically, it just, yeah. And that's, that's life. And I think that's, that's the other thing that like, I'm a fairly laid back, easygoing kind of guy. And I don't know that that helps with the, you know, you're going to get hired and you're going to get fired at some point. You know, there's very few coaches that get hired one time and they stay in that job for 50 years. Yeah. So that's part and parcel of coaching professional sport. doesn't matter whether, I mean, look at soccer, look at anything. Um, and so um, I've never felt despondent by that. Um, if anything, it's always encouraged me to, you know, seek out better opportunities and, um, you know, look at, look at what else is available. This, this incredible 10 year period of your life, um, you know, encompassing highest levels of Europe, you know, highest levels of Asia, highest levels of Middle East, um, highest levels of world basketball, NBA, G League. Um, what, are your kind of thoughts now you know like like you've seen it all with regards to you know being a british coach in that environment you know do you feel um like this you have to be absolutely uh, you know on your game you know or did you ever feel you know most disrespected at times um what what were your thought processes to towards that i mean i you know I've never felt disrespected because I really don't care what other people think. Um, I back myself at the end of the day. I don't, what other people think of me or what they think of your progression or what they think of your career path or how you got there or what you did. <clears throat> I know that I've invested a large proportion of my life to doing what I do. And I need, and in order to be the best that I can be. And um, so I've never, I've never worried about that stuff. Um, it, it, like I say, you back yourself. You know, yeah. you know, I back myself to be successful and to be able to continue to improve. I think you have to be on point. You have to know what you're talking. You have to invest in your game. Um, you have to get out of a bubble that you're comfortable in uh, and stretch yourself. You have to be prepared to make mistakes uh, and you have to be prepared to be fired. And uh, I think there's a lot of people that fear that, you know, all of those, those points. And I think if you fear that, then coaching is not the life for you. And, um, and just, just on that, that's a really important, that's a great point, coach. And that's something that um, I've not heard too many of our British coaches obviously talk about. Um, do you think that if you were, say, brought up in Greece or Spain or Italy, um, or, you know, even to a lesser extent in the USA, you, you would, you would have that, you know, if you were in the system as a coach, you would feel that you would have that understanding, um, that kind of resiliency um, to that situation, you would be ready for it. Or do you think that that's I think, something? I think, uh, I think, I think there's two things. I think coach development in countries like that is superior. I think they produce more coaches. There are more opportunities for Italians or Greeks to coach professionally. Um, I also think that they are an environment where they see and understand that they can, they see coaches hired and they see them fired and they see the hour that, so they have a model that they, uh, uh, you know, that 
their expectations are met, not met, but they understand the expectations early on. Mm. I think the UK uh, and the BBL is very different. I think there are long-term coaches, um, you know, over the years, people have been in the league, they may lose, they may win, they stay in that environment. And there's ne no, not necessarily a progression. Mm. So I don't feel like at times there is pressure None. Like in the UK for pe for, for some, some of those coaches. And don't get me wrong, there are some coaches, we talk about it all the time, there are a handful of coaches there that invest and have grown and you've seen the, the growth. But I think part of the BBL is that there's complacency. We just, we are, we're prepared to stay with the same. There's, there's no real coach development going to, to the detail that we see overseas that puts pressure on those coaches. There's no expectation whether they win or lose that there's no fear of being fired. No, absolutely. And, uh, you know, so I think that's a, just a very, it's a very different model. And, uh, you know, does that sometimes hold the, the BBL back? Yeah. I, you know, I think it probably does. I think that we, we, are uh, we, the, the BBL or British basketball within that context has allowed us to settle for mediocrity may not be the right word, but no. complacency. Um, and, and, you know, we don't challenge and we don't push and, um, we see the same year in year out. So interesting. interesting. And I think going back to that, what you said, I think if you grew up in those countries in Spain and Italy and thing, you always have in the back of your mind, I lose three games in a row. I make, I'm going to get fired. Absolutely. And so therefore you, inv you invest, yeah. you know, you don't become complacent. You invest in your game. You're continually trying to improve and you have aspirations of moving from, you know, D C B A, you know, whatever it is the levels of the league that you have. And I just, sometimes I just think that we don't create that situation, you know, the same situation within, within the UK. Interesting. Um, we need to move on just a little bit now. So your thoughts on um, British, the British coaching fraternity. Um, I know that you've got some thoughts on this and obviously um, I've tried to um, be, you know, articulate and eloquent in how I uh, say that people have not really followed and understood your story. And I find it quite uh, embarrassing. Um, so, you know, again, you know, did you ever, you know, you, you were ingrained in the British coaching fraternity when you were here, especially in that young uh, period of your life, the, the, the coaching fraternity, the, the, the national junior um, period. Um, but, you know, now what, what are your thoughts on it? I, I, I have always, I have always been passionate about British basketball um, and still am. And I, you know, I, you know, Regardless of whether people, you know, like I said to you before, I don't, that, that doesn't, you know, people not paying attention, not knowing whatever, it, that, that's irrelevant to me, you know. Um, I, more than anybody, I would love to see British basketball competing in a EuroLeague environment, competing in a Euro Cup environment, because I know we have the talent, you know, the ability to do that if it would, if it's to be done the right way. And, um, I think first and foremost, I've always been passionate about making sure that British players have the opportunity. And I, you know, there are some programs now that have embraced that and are starting to move forward. Um, I, the biggest frustration for me at all is that like, there's a lot of younger coaches that, that are out there that would benefit from, uh, your experiences and benefit from from my experiences um but i can i mean i don't think i've spoken to anybody i mean that i've had a couple of coaches reach out um but i think there's a lot of a lot of information that like i said you were talking earlier like you know 30 years of experience within basketball and 30 years of experience within basketball 60 years combined of basketball and yet and, and very different experiences to a lot of the coaches or a lot of the people that are involved with basketball mm. that could help or even help open doors for people elsewhere. 
and yet nobody, you know, you, you they, just don't feel that they use you as a resource. I don't, do you think that that, just, I mean, you know, we've obviously had these discussions. So, um, I mean, do you feel, you know, federation, you know, that's something that, you know, we, we do a poor job of not just basketball England, you know, British basketball reaching now, trying to bring, you know, people with expertise in, you know, even on a, you know, advisory type role. Um, do you feel that that, that should have happened or could have happened? Yeah, I mean, uh, for sure. Uh, yeah, ultimately, we're coaches and teachers, and we want to, you know, as a coach and a teacher, you're always trying to impart knowledge or wisdom or help develop people. Um, and I think you have, you know, you you have a, available resources to you, and that's not just you and I. I mean, it's it's a multitude of coaches that are around, even coaches that you know may operate now in the BBL. Why you know why is Rob being so successful? You know, what is it that Rob Paternostra has done, you know, to, to undoubtedly be one of the most successful coaches around in the, in the modern game, you know, in the modern time. Um, and I don't know, I, I, I'm out of the loop completely with British mm -hmm. English basketball and British basketball. Um, and that may well be my part of my doing in terms of, you know, you become focused on what you do in terms of your career. Um, and I haven't, being back to the UK as regularly as you have. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I also think that if you look at other federations and organizations around the world, they utilize people's experiences that, you know, we're getting to a point now where there are some bright young coaches coming through that could really do with, you know, direction and coach education. And this is, you know, adapting to a professional lifestyle, your next stage. Um, but, uh, and I, th that may be in place, but I don't mm. know. Um, it's not something that, that I've been involved in my, you know, I'm, I've always been happy to, to volunteer time and talk to people or do whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a change of management within both those organizations, GB basketball and with England basketball. And, you know, sometimes stuff just gets, you know, missed out or you know, pushed under a carpet and forgotten about because it's just, you know, there's so many other things going on. We could talk and, you know, we have just skirted over a lot of the, your, your career and, you know, philosophy and everything else, which I always, um, you know, hate doing because there's just so many directions we can go on in these talks, but we've already been going for almost an hour and a half. So I, let's it might just, have to be a, a part two. Tony. Yeah, it must definitely be a part two. So <laughs> let's go with four quick questions to finish this up sure. with. Um, yeah. Favorite drill um you know uh yeah favorite favorite basketball drill or oh, man i mean there's so many now i mean it's you know more over time one of the things you talked about was development like everything i do now is is as a young coach you kind of see things and put it in and it's never never connected to what you're doing and you know a lot of breakdown stuff i've you know you've streamlined in terms of what we do so everything's game related um and believe me you know when i say you know, I tell you, and you'll know this, like the best stuff is the basic stuff because it underpins everything you're going to do uh, no matter what. Um, I'm not a huge sets guy in terms of, you know, I want to play, you know, early reads and transition, open offense. Um, so we, felt, you know, spent a lot of time on, on that, you know, really being solid defensively, working on defensive transition, eliminating easy baskets for the opposition, forcing them to take, analytically you know bad shots um so everything like it, it's really hard i mean there's a t so many drills that i and you and you know as you move forward you get your package starts like this and then your package becomes smaller and smaller because you realize that you know what it's the key stuff it's the fundamentals it's the basics that's repeated daily it becomes a habit you know aristotle has a great uh you know, you know, you are repeat, you are what you do repeat, you are repeatedly what you do, do what you are repeatedly. And it's awesome. When we were doing national teams, John Clark, who was with me, was the one that found that. And we had it on everything that we gave players, you know, you are what you repeatedly do. And it's about habit and it's about run, you know, do so 
it's become really simple. The game is really simple and we make it complicated. And I found that's one, you know, probably one of the things over the time is that there's a lot, of, there's a lot of basic drills that I do that are related. And we, you know, from two on two, three on three, four on four, we may, may not get to five on five at, at times. Um, but it helps you deliver the message, you know, on a, on a regular basis. So I, I don't know. I don't think I could give you one particular. All right, okay. Uh, go to favorite saying or statement. Is that what it is? Uh, what you say almost yeah, on, a I mean, you know, like, on a daily, daily basis. I mean, we, you know, we, I've always, you know, talked about just, um, habit is always one of just, you know, it, it was always referring to just habits, habits, habit, you know, like, so I don't know that I've got a, a go-to phrase, but I, there's, you know, there's probably a handful of things that circle around that I catch myself saying, but, um, yeah, I don't think there's a catchphrase. Okay. Favorite all-time basketball coach. Um, I mean, I've had the opportunity to work alongside some great people and, I, you know, all-time favorite. I, I don't, you know, I, I love what Popovich has always done in terms of just the simplicity and stuff that he does and have admired that and had an opportunity to be around the Spurs for a while. Um, but I'm telling you now, like, the two guys that have been in both of our lives, Nick Nurse and Chris Finch, um, are two, probably two of the best coaches I've ever seen in terms of the way that they they are able to master the game. And, you know, Chris should be there, Nick is there. Um, and that's been a thing. So I think, you know, for me, those two guys have, you know, they're just phenomenal people, phenomenal coaches. Yeah. That's a, that's a great, that's a great point. I mean, now they're, they're, you, you, they're not, their names are not out of place when we talk about that. That's the, absolutely not. Basically. Absolutely not. No. Um, always a tough one. You've coached so many players, but favorite players to coach. You know, I had, a. A lot of my uh, the young guys that I've coached have been some of the best, like Jamel, um, Colin, uh, Miles, Zach. Um, you know, along with a few people that went, you know, I had the opportunity to work with that. You know, Coach Andrew Sullivan, um, Diane Clark. You know, Richard Midgley. Like a lot of the younger kids that I've been around, and then. You know, obviously, being having an opportunity to be around Lawal in terms of his professionalism. Um, you know, there were two or three of those guys on that team: Andy Betts and Robert Archibald. Were, you know, phenomenal people, and you know, just in terms of the thing, but also their percent, you know, their their game and the ability to absorb information and their knowledge. You know, from a British perspective, and then, you know, I'd be having an opportunity to be around a number of high level. You know, witness being around a lot, a lot of high level players. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, I've, I've, I've had immense satisfaction from th that younger generation of players that have been, uh, been involved. Coach, uh, we got to wrap it up here now. Um, we, like I said, we could talk for um, more than three or four hours uh, and, and just <laughs> go into some of the details, but um, I really appreciate it. I just want to say, uh, thank you for being on this uh, Time Out um, podcast. But more importantly, I hope that the coaches um, really, you know, try to take something from from your story and from what you've done, you know, and what you've achieved because um, it is an incredible achievement for where you have gone. Um, and I hope that it inspires um, coaches to believe that they can get to that level um, if they, you know, are willing to take you know, some degree of risk and also, you know, to push themselves to, to you know, to, to even further in their boundaries. Uh, yeah, I, absolutely. And I think that's, that's part, you know, part of us moving on and passing on and, um, you know, expectations of older coaches in order to help these young, we're not going to be able to do it, you know, for the rest of our lives. And there's going to be another, another generation behind the next generation and behind the next generation. And, Ultimately, you have to share and you have to be prepared to, 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 to help and promote, um, especially when it's such a closed knit community that we have within British basketball with all the challenges and the hurdles that, that we have to face. Great. Thank you, coach. Really appreciate it. Tony, I appreciate it. Thank you very much.